So I've actually turned the hose off for a second. It's caught up with me. So um, all the subsoils around the edge now, as you can see, um, the water is rising quite nicely. Uh, and you can see the clarity of the water is still staying relatively uh, clear because of the bucket uh, and the hose in the bucket. Um, don't worry about any kind of initial scum that you get on the surface. It's just kind of the air coming out of the soil and it will clear within a day or two. You'll notice a lot of fizzing as well uh, from the air in the soil. Um, but that's absolutely normal and once we get the oxygenators in there over the next day or two they'll clear pretty quickly. So this end we did say we'd be doing a little bit of a, a beach for a cobble beach for the blackbirds and robins and everything else so at the end of the day you want to make a nice little area for them. There's no right or wrong way to do this but I tend to make a fairly deep cobble area just because if you don't you tend to find that uh, a lot of the vegetation comes through in time. So a few cobble seed will be absolutely fine. And then after that it will just give the birds that nice little bit of clear area for them to get down to the pond. Things like the hedgehog, we've got a resident hedgehog in this garden and he or she will be visiting no doubt to uh, take a drink from it. Hopefully the bird bath won't be completely redundant. Although having said that, they've now got a giant bird bath. So this will be a really nice little addition to the corner of the pond and of course the client can sit on the gazebo and watch the birds quite nicely who are very tame because of the regular feeding so it'll be a really lovely addition to the pond. So now I'm at the final trim stage. Um, it's fine if you go level with the grass at this point. If you go a little bit above, no problem because what we'll actually do at the end is you need to save a little bit of soil if you can and this doesn't matter if it's a little bit fertile or whatever and that will just kind of go over the edges and we'll just kind of rub that into the edge of the lawn and that will just blend in and hide any last little bits of liner so as soon as I've finished this last final trim of the main liner and then the fleece underneath we can look at dressing the edges. So now that the beach is in and we're just waiting for the water to fill up now uh, it's time to add a few additional features that are really going to improve the diversity that's drawn to this pond and that is of course rotting logs. Now you may think this might be quite unattractive but uh, the ones I brought with me today I think are quite beautiful. Now uh, the purpose of putting rotting logs around the edge of the pond are things such as southern hawker dragonflies, the big bright green ones uh, that we see dart around our gardens. But the females actually, they are the females, the bright green ones, the males are sort of blue and green as well. Uh, but they actually lay their eggs into rotting timber and have found over time that they actually prefer to lay on logs that are sort of half in the water and half out the water. Uh, so by putting a couple of logs into the water you are providing a habitat for those larvae to hatch into and then crawl into the pond and start preying on other invertebrates. Now not only the dragonflies, uh, the little bits of bark and log piles and that's around the edge of the pond will be great little hunting grounds for things such as your frogs as soon as they emerge the baby froglets um, so that's another great addition you can have to the pond or another little bit of habitat that you can provide. So I'm going to do a bit of a here's some I found earlier and bring some over. Now look at these, these are absolutely fantastic. Uh, this looks as if it's a bit of an apple off one of the apple trees and um, I've also got a couple of bits of uh, oak which have just dropped out of the trees. Um, around the yard and they're, they're really quite fantastic. I mean this is as solid as anything this sort of air cured oak uh, and they make for probably the most important part of any pond a dragonfly perch. Uh, now by putting one of these in you're actually creating a little perch particularly the males of the dragonflies and damselflies will want to land on a prominent perch so they can survey their territory if you like and hunt for insects. They obviously need somewhere to land so they can look. They've got actually 360 or near enough 360 degree vision so if you can put something like this in the middle of the pond of course they've got a great chance of seeing any insect that goes past. So I'm going to put one of these on the edge of the pond now. And I quite fancy this to go into the middle. And if you just sort of nestle it in while the soil's damp like this it'll make for a great perch. 
I don't think I'll bother with this one because it's quite a small pond. You don't want to overcrowd it with uh, bits of wood. But I'm actually going to go and get a couple of bigger bits of wood now uh, that'll supply the, the rotting timber habitat, if you like, for the southern hawkers to lay in. So I've got some a nice selection here. And again, bits like this bark are going to be great because they'll really provide a little uh, hidey hole, if you like, for all the small frogs to go in. So um, I'm going to put this, I think, on the back of the pond. But I'm actually going to wait. I'm going to wait until that's um, the water level's a bit higher and I can actually see uh, the liner to trim it off and then I can put this on as an additional, sort of almost in the border a little bit. So here's a perfect bit of rotting log uh, that can actually supply the habitat for the uh, the southern hawkers. So I'm going to just position that on the edge of the pond. So I'm just going to put one more little log pile in uh, along the edge of the pond. Again, some more rotting logs for the dragonflies. But these little log stacks will really provide a nice little home for a lot of uh, a lot of the other smaller animals in the pond and some bark as well half submerged and a little bit over so it's just providing a nice little bit of habitat I'm sure the frogs will thank me for it so now that the pond's reaching its final level, uh, I've just turned the hose off just to give me a couple of minutes to go around and make a start on the liner before the water level actually rises enough to reach the sides, if you like, and overflow. Now I've designed the pond so that actually the lowest part of the pond is in the back corner over there. And that's basically so that it can then flow into what's effectively a little frog hostel or an old little washing up bowl that's in the ground, which is uh, you know, likely to be full of frogs once they're attracted to this pond. And it's nice to have another little part of a, a separate water body that they can move off and feed from. Uh, so, and that's the lowest part of the this area of the garden as well. So, uh, when you're designing your pond, it's it's a good point to think. Well, actually, if the pond does overflow, which way is the water going to go? And and you can do that by either getting a, a level or uh, a theodolite or something like that. But again, you don't have to. You, it's just you should probably have an idea where it will overflow. But in all honesty, in 15 years of making these. I've never had anybody ring me up and say because we put the pond in the gardens flooded. Uh, what you tend to find is, particularly on bigger water bodies, once they do start to fill up uh, and to and, and breach the level of where they're designed to hold water to, the uh, the water that the way that it sort of ingresses into the ground around it is is so gradual that is you know you'd have to have some pretty torrential rain uh, for several hours to uh, actually make a difference into the surrounding ground, and even then it will quite quickly drain away, no doubt. So. There shouldn't be any issues, but just thought I'd point that out. So again, while the water is at this point and we know roughly where the, the line is going to be at, I can now start trimming the edges. So if you go around first and start with your fleece, uh, your underlay, uh, but be very careful, of course, not to catch the liner underneath. The best thing is to just sort of pull the, pull the fleece away uh, and cut away from the actual liner itself. Uh, just to avoid any last minute punctures. It would be horrific if you were to put a hole in the liner at this point. Uh, but at least you'd know where it was if you do make that mistake and you can get a little patch and just glue it on it should be fine uh, so i'm going to go around and trim the fleece first uh, then with the liner i usually do it in two stages so i'll do an initial trim to uh, within three or four inches of where the water level is uh, and then i'll put the hose back on and let that fill up a little bit more and just play around with the edges because of course you can m mount some soil either side of the liner uh, to create the final level or the lowest point if you like particularly over there I don't want the water level too low so that the water doesn't come up uh, to the right point where I want on this beach. I want it to come up another inch or so, it'll be absolutely fine. And by lifting the soil up and packing some soil behind it, you can quite easily adjust the level uh, of the pond itself, the water level. So yeah, so we're nearly there and um, I'll go around, I'll trim the fleece now and then take my initial cut off the liner uh, and then the fleece below and um, then we can start thinking about the plants.
that's all the edges of the liner and the fleece cut off and you can see it's actually starting to finally take the shape of a pond. Now all that's really left to do now in terms of the groundwork is actually go around the edges with a bit more subsoil and just fill over the bit of liner and obviously because it's flush with the grass as long as you come over it by an inch or so then it shouldn't hopefully ever show through. So I'm going to do that now and then we can really start thinking about plants. So that's all the subsoil patted down and all ready for planting and all that's left to do now is put this big bit of bark that I decided to leave out earlier on when I was positioning the logs uh, on the edge of the border where it'll give some uh, vital habitat for baby frogs and things as they emerge out of the pond uh, at the back end of summer so uh, yeah I'm going to put that in the border now then I'm going to just top the pond up to its final level it's fine at this point if you want to let it slightly overflow uh, because this will be a really good indicator as to what level to set your marginal plants at which we'll explain in a moment um, but they're going to be the plants that really need to be on the water's edge things like water avens, water mint uh, and brook lime those sort of things but uh, we'll talk about those in a minute uh, so I'm going to put the hose on in a second and then just fill it up uh, and then we can start getting the plants in So the pond's now at its full level and it's time for the best bit of the job and that's planting your pond. Now the plants you choose to put around your pond really will determine exactly how much wildlife and the range of wildlife that you can expect to visit you over the course of a year. Now the water itself I filled up with tap water and of course in an ideal world you'd fill it up with natural rainwater. However, I quite often don't have access to rainwater for the size ponds that I create around the country so quite often a tap is the only means of filling the pond up. Uh, now you can let your pond fill up naturally over time as well uh, so if it was to rain you know unfortunately uh, over the last couple of months we've had very little rain so it, it would in fact probably take three, three or four months for your pond to naturally fill to the levels you need it to be at so uh, and a lot of you will no doubt be uh, eager to get the tap on and to get this pond uh, brimming with life so uh, but I've just left the pond for 24 hours now just to let a bit of the chlorine and everything else that's in tap water kind of disperse a little bit and it will go over time uh, and by doing it this way unfortunately you probably will have a few issues with blanket weed but there's ways you can combat that and we'll talk about those now. Now when you come into or when you come to plant your pond you actually find that there's, there's four main uh, categories if you like of plants that you need to put in and around your pond uh, to maximise the biodiversity that will be drawn to it. Now the first category I like to uh, call as the emergent vegetation. So this is everything that's going to grow out of the side of the pond, some real structure around the pond and things like this hard rush which are great because uh, they're effectively evergreen, they'll stay like this all year round, they provide good cover uh, for a lot of invertebrates and things through the winter months as well. Uh, but also it's great because it plays a vital role in the life cycle of our damselflies and dragonflies. Now these insects spend most of their life actually under the water as a nymph and they're absolutely amazing. They're, they're quite alien like in their appearance uh, and some of them can be two to three inches long, some of their bigger uh, kind of hawkers and emperors. Uh, but So they will be underwater for a year or two in that stage but eventually when they decide enough's enough I'm going to emerge now uh, and turn into a dragonfly they will obviously need some vegetation to crawl up to then break out of their old casing and turn into these amazing insects and quite often at uh, this time of year it's early June now you can find the, the spent cases of these insects actually still clinging to uh, the stems uh, around the edge of your pond so it's a great one to show the kids and my kids absolutely love trying to find them. So emergent vegetation is a good one you don't have to go for hard rush you could go for things as well like small irises but I would just probably avoid flag iris uh, or yellow flag the native yellow flag iris in this instance because they can take over the edge of a pond and create quite a, uh, a decent sized clump of vegetation so flag iris I wouldn't or well, I'm not going to put any in this pond in particular um, but so the ve emergent vegetation something like a hard rush would be fantastic I mean they'll also use the stems of things like um, this is water plantain and the, and the the actual this part of the leaf is, is very very rigid so it's perfect for them to climb up just to hold on to while they break out of their shell uh, and pump their wings up before they fly off. So 
which also I might as well go on to the next category which is your marginal plants if you like and these are plants that are going to want to be right on the water's edge so obviously by filling your pond up to the full level and seeing where the water lies uh, it gives you the best chance if you try and plant your pond uh, before the water level reaches its final level these plants could be placed slightly too high up and therefore it'd be a bit dry uh, and they not enjoy the situation too much so uh, your marginal plants are things that are going to really want to have their feet wet so things like this water plantain I really love not only does it look great structurally uh, but it has these lovely little white uh, flowers on the end of these very rigid flower stems and uh, they do look very attractive and they're great for insects as well so water plantain that's one of them uh, a favourite of, of mine actually uh, water mint which is great because it'll grow almost anywhere uh, it will grow in drier conditions as well but, but water mint will actually you know, really want to have its feet quite wet and it'll even travel across a beach uh, by just uh, running by suckers if you like and spreading its roots sideways but smells brilliant the leaves are yeah classic smell uh, that minty smell so it looks it's great if you brush against it and also the flowers are very attractive when it does flower uh, for a lot of our pollinating insects particularly things like holly blue butterflies uh, and bees as well love it when it comes into flower so water mint uh, it will get quite big and quite vigorous so you'll probably find yourself ripping a few clumps out throughout the course of the year but that's fine uh, it'll come back year after year it's a great great perennial um, another good one brook lime now this is a really good plant because the leaves are quite soft you can bend them very easily uh, and that makes them great and very attractive for our newts our smooth newts um, which are particular uh, in the way that they lay their eggs because they like to lay a single egg and then actually fold the leaf around the egg so um, by having this soft vegetation on the margins of the pond it's creating the best habitat you can uh, for newts to uh, come in your pond not only to visit to feed but then to make it a home and of course lay their eggs and produce offspring uh, so those are a few of the kind of the really um, damp loving uh, plants that you should look to include around your edges in terms of uh, of the second category the third category uh, are you kind of your marginals but set further back if you like so things that like their feet damp but will prefer or, or do absolutely fine in slightly drier settings as well and these are things such as the cuckoo flower this one's looking particularly good at the moment uh, which is very attractive for uh, the orange tip butterfly that comes to lay its eggs um, on this uh, crucifer so it's a, a great one for them but also there's a lot of other insects use it uh, some of the bee flies as well will nectar on it. Things like purple loosestrife, another great one. I mean, I wouldn't personally plant a pond without a single purple loosestrife. Uh, they are fantastic for a whole array of butterflies and bees. Uh, particularly, that they are good as well because they're a slightly later flowering uh, plant. So again, they're, they're almost coming into flower now. This is a particularly small specimen, but they're, they're coming into flower now early to mid-June and they'll be going right the way through to August. Uh, in some cases so uh, a great one for our summer insects another one that likes his feet wet you may already have guessed is this uh, water forget-me-not uh, which is looking particularly attractive these lovely delicate little flowers uh, many of you know the forget-me-not that likes to rampage through our herbaceous borders but this one does like its feet wet so is great on the edge of a pond very attractive for a lot of bees and butterflies as well this beast is greater bird's foot trefoil now you may know bird's foot trefoil from some of my previous videos as being the larval food plant of the common blue butterfly uh, but greater tre great, uh, greater bird's foot trefoil actually loves having uh, its feet wet and being in damp conditions so it thrives very well uh, on the edge of a pond be warned it will spread very well so uh, uh, put it where you want it to cover a big area if you like but a, a great one and it'll sort of almost climb up semi climbing habit through the rest of the vegetation so you get these lovely yellow trefoil flowers in the summer uh, another one that I like is um, this figwort which is um, solely pollinated by wasps I believe so uh, it's got a quite a discreet little flower but also it's a great one because recently I found some moth mullein uh, sorry mullein moth caterpillars uh, on the actual leaves uh, chomping away at the leaves and I actually filmed one I'll see if I can put a clip in now of uh, the caterpillar eating a whole uh, flower head uh, within a matter of minutes so <laughs> quite gregarious when they uh, when they get to a larger size so figwort is a nice one it's quite sort of thin as you can see in its structure so it won't take up a lot of space uh, and does provide vital food for several insects and the last category we're going to look at is your um, 
floating leaf plants. Sorry, second to last. There's your floating leaf plants, uh, which is going to be things like this broadleaf pondweed, which is a great one for covering the surface of the pond. Now, when you're designing your pond, you really want to try and uh, encourage 60 to 70 percent of the surface of the water to be covered in these sorts of plants. I've got broadleaf pond weed here, but I've also got some uh, fringed water lily, which is another favourite of mine, another native miniature lily if you like has lovely yellow almost marigold um, sort of flowers uh, it's fantastic fantastic little uh, plant it does spread very well both of these will spread very well but you want to aim for 60 to 70 percent water surface coverage because that will just keep the light levels down in the pond and combat the blanket weed that we've spoke about previously uh, because the blanket weed loves warm kind of margins and quite often it'll grow start growing around the margins of your pond where the water is shallow and of course it warms a block quicker um, but of course by shading out a lot of the pond with these plants you are going to be doing the best thing you can to try and combat uh, the encroachment of uh, blanket weed shall we say so floating leaf plants they play a vital role and the final category which is probably the most important one is this stuff the oxygenating plant now this is hornwort you can also use things such as spiked water mill foil uh, but it's a great plant because this will literally fizz with bubbles it gives off oxygen and it completely negates the uh, need for any kind of pumps or electricity a lot of people ask me you know oh well I want a wildlife pond but I don't want the aggro of running electric down the garden and having a pump and the cost of all that you don't need any of that the, the most important way you can actually uh, increase oxygen into a pond is and the best way is by using this oxygenating plant and you can literally throw that in the middle and what it'll do it'll drop down in the winter time root itself again uh, or in the springtime and then grow back up from those roots so you won't have to add any more once you've sort of put this in the pond so uh, an absolutely vital role it will play in the life and the health of your wildlife pond so quick recap your four main categories your emergent vegetation your marginal plants, um, your floating leaf plants, and your oxygenator. If you remember those four things, uh, then your pond will absolutely thrive, I'm sure. And if you do, incidentally, want to know a full comprehensive list of all the plants that you can put in and around your pond, uh, then my book, Wild Your Garden, um, is available, and that's got a whole list. Uh, and to be honest, it's got a list of everything that you could ever want in terms of a wildlife garden uh, at the back of the book, which is everything to do with trees, shrubs, what plants to put in your herbaceous borders uh, and I'll put a little vi video link uh, at the end of this video. So that's hopefully given you enough of inf enough information to, uh, to go out there and start planting your pond now. Uh, I'm going to get out there, get out here and space them out now and uh, yeah, hopefully by uh, within an hour's time this will be all planted up and it will already have some visitors. There's been a blackbird in the edge of the pond this morning having a bath and the client said to me that last night, the first night of the water being in the pond, there's actually a hedgehog coming down to drink, which is absolutely brilliant. I'll try and get some footage of that. Um, so yeah, once the plants are in, we can then talk about how you're going to uh, fill in the gaps in between. Quite often I sow a wet loving wildflower mixture uh, in between the plants, um, or a seed mixture if you like, of wet loving wildflowers. And that'll just include things like your grasses, uh, which of course will just help fill in any gaps and equally provide that bit of crucial cover uh, for any um, invertebrates or amphibians through any winter month or through the winter months when they are kind of hunting still on milder days. So um, I'm going to go and space the plants out now and turn this into a proper wildlife pond.
despite the weather, I'm pleased to say I'm finally finished and the result speaks for itself. I mean, it's already attracting wildlife. There's blackbirds been hopping around the edge just desperate to get for a drink and a bath. Uh, and I'm sure the insects will follow very, very shortly. There's just one more job I've got left to do, and that is to put in a few little pond snails and critters that I've brought from another pond just to kickstart this pond's population and give some interest for the client. A few pond snails, ram's horns, looking brilliant. They can go in. And I've got a couple of little water boatmen as well. To be fair, these insects are very quickly find this kind of a water body so because uh, they can fly but um, yeah not very often that uh, you have to wait for very long so I'm going to fish him out when I find him and put him in the pond and then that really is it now in terms of maintenance for your pond you shouldn't have to do anything much for the first uh, season in particular uh, when the stems get longer in the winter things like uh, the purple loose stripe they're actually a good source of seed for uh, a lot of birds so leave them on if you can uh, but a lot of the vegetation as well I always tend to leave around the edge if you can leave a, a foot or so's margin just so it gives uh, your sort of invertebrates and uh, small frogs and anything like that just some cover throughout the rest of the year and there's really not much need to cut all that back I don't cut any of the edges of mine back and um, in terms of the the blanket weed you will no doubt if you've used tap water to get some blanket weed come into the pond um, if you get some just just pull it out either if you can't reach from the side just get a little what I call a spring tine rake or leaf rake and just gently sift it out but the most important thing when you are clearing out blanket weed is to just leave it on the stone on the side for a day or so just to let any sort of you know water lice or dragonfly nymphs and that sort of crawl back into the pond before you then put the vegetation when it's dried out onto your compost heap. Uh, and do check as well if you're bringing, it, bringing in a big raft of it uh, then just check it's not folded over because sometimes it's easy for, for newts and frogs to actually get caught up in the middle of it um, so just pick through it when you put it on the side and make sure there's no animals inside it uh, and that really is it really to be honest there's not much more that can go wrong with it uh, and it's just time now to sit back and enjoy it um, and thank you so much for watching if you've enjoyed the video do subscribe to the channel and give the video a like and I'll be sure to bring you more videos on all the sort of work I do and all the gardens that I design and create throughout the course of the year. Stay tuned and I'll see you soon.